Hello and welcome. It's good of you to join me. I hope you're well and that you always have fair weather when you go camping. I'm Alex and this is Cannonball, a podcast where we talk about the European literary canon and the history, culture, philosophy, art, and science that surrounds it. You can find a list of what I'll be reading each week throughout 2023 at volrathpublishing.com. That's V-O-L-L-R-A-T-H publishing.com. Over the next hour, we will be exploring this week's reading, the full title of which is Areopagitica, a speech of Mr. John Milton for the liberty of unlicensed printing to the Parliament of England. We will learn a bit about Milton and 17th century England, the politics of the time that he was living in, and look at some passages from this polemic. Though we cannot meet and speak with these great men of the past, we can still access their writings, into which they put the maximum of their thought and care, and which constitute a great cultural treasure. In studying their writings, we are not simply reading passages out of a book. We are making direct, if one-way, contact with some of the great minds of history and being enriched by the contact, which is an excellent way to spend an hour. John Milton was born in 1608 in London. He was the son of another John Milton, who was by passion a composer of religious music and by trade a financier. John Milton the Elder converted to Protestantism before his son was born, and for this his father, Richard Milton, disowned him. The work of John Milton Sr. made him rich enough to hire tutors of classical languages for his sons and to send them to school and university. This also meant that John Milton Jr. never had to work, so he could spend his whole life focusing on writing. His father, who as mentioned was himself a composer, also ensured that his children were educated in music. This trinity of a knowledge of classical languages, a knowledge of music, and having a largely free schedule due to not needing to work certainly does not guarantee that a young man would turn into John Milton. There have been many people, both men and women, throughout history whose lives have had these circumstances, and only one of them became John Milton. Indeed, Milton himself had three siblings who all lived under the same circumstances, and they did not become the most legendary or among the most legendary poets of English. All the same, it is not surprising that such an oak grew in such soil. After going off to Cambridge, he was home for a year. It's not clear why. It's either because he was suspended for arguing with one of his teachers or because there was a plague in Cambridge in that year. This is now 1625. After graduating, he studied independently for about six years and then traveled around Europe. In his travels, he met many learned men of the day, including Hugo Grotius, whose writings, among other things, have had a lasting impact on international law. And he also visited Galileo while he was under house arrest in Arcetri, which is in Florence. He experienced Carnival in Rome and also met Lucas Holst, a librarian at the Vatican who took Milton on a tour of its library. In 1639, he returned to England where the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, which would rock the British Isles for the next 14 years, had already begun in the form of the Bishop's Wars. These wars started after King Charles I tried to force Anglican practices in the Scottish Church. Though not all modern Anglicanism fits into this description of Catholicism without the Pope, for our purposes in understanding this history and the divides, in the British Isles during this period, it's useful to think of it that way, that Anglicanism and that the religion of the king is more similar to Catholicism than to Protestantism, and that a lot of the resistance that we're going to see is coming from people who we would today categorize as more Protestant. So Charles I was trying to force Anglicanism in the Scottish Church, and the Scots, on the other hand, sought to abolish Episcopacy, which is the governance of a church by bishops. And that eventually started a small war that was just the first step in a bigger war. Without going into too much detail about this period, it is worth going back a bit to 1626, when George Villiers, who was the first Duke of Buckingham, was in command of English forces in Europe. He was a favorite of King James I, and of James's son, Charles I, who was now the king. Despite being very popular with the king, he was immensely unpopular in general due to his major failure in leading an expedition in Spain in 1625, which was a total disaster. So in 1626, Parliament dismissed Villiers, and King Charles responded to Villiers' dismissal by dissolving Parliament. That is certainly one way to solve a problem. In 1628, Charles recalled Parliament, 
which drew up a Petition of Right, a document that set out specific individual protections against the state. Though not well known, this document was reportedly equal in value to the Magna Carta and England's 1689 Bill of Rights. Charles accepted it. In August of that year, an army officer, John Felton, assassinated Villiers. Despite the public celebration of Felton's assassination of Villiers, Felton was executed for it. Five months later, in January 1629, Charles dissolved Parliament again and began to rule directly. It was then in 1637, we're skipping over a period there, that Charles tried to force Anglican services on the Presbyterian Church of Scotland. This eventually led to the Bishop's War in 1639 and 1640. In 1640, Charles recalled Parliament, and in April, the short Parliament met again. By the way, the period of 11 years from 1629 to 1640, during which Charles ruled without Parliament, is referred to as personal rule. In early May, just three weeks after Parliament had been re-established, Charles dissolved it again, like a sugar cube in hot tea. This was six months before his 40th birthday, making him perhaps the only man in history to have dissolved Parliament three times before the age of 40. In August, the Scots won the Battle of Newburn, which was the only serious fighting in the Bishop's War. In October of that year, Charles was forced to sign the Treaty of Ripon, which meant that the Long Parliament would convene. Now, the Long Parliament could be dissolved only by the agreement of its members, meaning Charles could not dissolve it. They were catching on. In December, a crowd of 1,500 Londoners brought to Parliament the Root and Branch Petition, which was signed by 15,000 more Londoners, calling on Parliament to abolish episcopacy, quote, from its roots and in all its branches, end quote. In July 1641, Parliament passed the Habeas Corpus Act of 1640, which abolished the Star Chamber, which was a whole other thing. Charles went to Scotland and conceded to the Scots' demands for the official establishment of Presbyterianism. But in October, there was a plot by royalists to kidnap several Scottish nobles who had opposed Charles' attempts to control the Scottish church. The plot failed, and Charles denied any involvement, but it still made Charles look like he was either untrustworthy or he did not have control of his people. In August, Parliament rejected the Root and Branch Bill. In October, a Catholic-led uprising broke out in Ireland. In in December, Parliament presented a list of grievances called the Grand Remonstrance to Charles. It was a general objection to a range of policies and listed 204 separate items. It called for the expulsion of all bishops from Parliament, a purge of officials, with Parliament having a right of veto over crown appointments, and an end to the sale of land confiscated from Irish rebels. When the king did not answer these objections, Parliament publicized the document. Up to this point, there had been 22 bishops in the House of Lords. This had allowed the House of Lords to reliably block legislation proposed by the House of Commons, which was increasingly dominated by Puritans. Puritans is a word for anyone who wanted to reform or purify the Church of England and contained many different sects, including Presbyterians and Congregationalists. All of them opposed the bishops. In the same month, Parliament passed the Clergy Act of 1640, which forbade those in holy orders from exercising any temporal jurisdiction or authority. We would say political power. This meant no more bishops in the Privy Council, who were the king's advisors, and no more bishops in Parliament. This meant that after that, no one in Parliament could capture on a diagonal. On January 4th, 1642, Charles entered the House of Commons with armed soldiers to arrest five members of Parliament. Those five were John Pym, John Hampden, Denzel Hollis, Sir Arthur Hazelrig, and William Strode. These men have since been called the five members. John Hampden is the namesake of a beautiful, sleepy little town in western Massachusetts where I spent much of my childhood. That town in part inspired Howard Philip Lovecraft to write one of his best-known stories, but I will save that for another day. Charles entered Parliament with soldiers to arrest five men, accusing them of treason. Unfortunately, or fortunately, the men were not there at the time, and also the other members of the House of Commons considered the King's accusations to be a breach of the House's privilege, so the arrest failed. If we imagine that the attempted capture of the leaders of the opposition in Scotland had been directed by Charles, which I don't have any evidence that it was, but if we imagine that it was, and then we also have this second failed attempt to capture, to arrest some leaders, even in London, you have a government that is not that great at catching people. They've tried twice and failed in a pretty short period. At some point later in January, Parliament ordered Sir John Hotham 
who was a member of Parliament and governor of Hull at the time, to seize the large arsenal in Hull. In February, Charles's wife, Queen Henrietta Maria, went to the Netherlands with Princess Mary and the crown jewels. The Queen clearly remained capable of a diagonal move. In March, Parliament passed the Militia Ordinance, claiming the right to appoint military commanders without the King's approval. In April, John Hotham refused Charles or any of his men entry into Hull, maintaining control of the arsenal there. Despite this significant action on behalf of the parliamentarian cause, he and his son were later executed for treachery to the same cause. He apparently made secret negotiations with the royalists. In June, Parliament submitted the 19 propositions to Charles, in which they requested more power for Parliament in governing the kingdom. Charles rejected them. The following month, Charles tried and failed to besiege Hull, and Parliament appointed a committee of safety to oversee its side of the erupting civil war. After that, the swords were drawn, and for the next decade, the fields of Albion were soaked in the blood of the English, the Scottish, the Welsh, and the Irish. This history is as fascinating as it is complicated, and there is much more to it than this, but my point is not to give a comprehensive history of the English Civil War, only to put into context some of what we will look at relative to John Milton. It was amid all of this that the following year, as the fighting started, Parliament passed in June 1643 an ordinance for the regulating of printing against which Milton would later write his polemic. The ordinance mandated and authorized a number of things, including pre-publication licensing, the registration of all printing materials with the names of author, printer, and publisher, the search, seizure, and destruction of any books offensive to the government, and the arrest and imprisonment of any offensive writers, printers, and publishers. To go back just one year to cover some of Milton's life, in 1642, he married Mary Powell. They moved in together, and though it is not clear why, a few months later, she left that home and went to live with her mother. She was a royalist, and he was a parliamentarian, so they held opposing political views in this emerging war. At the time, there was an active debate about divorce, but it was not legal except in the case of adultery. Historians disagree on the extent to which Milton's marital problems informed his writing, so... Whatever the motivation may have been, Milton then published a series of pamphlets in favor of divorce outside of such cases, that is, outside of adultery. It may have been a coincidence. He maybe suddenly became very passionate about this issue. Partly because the political situation had deteriorated into full civil war, Mary Powell did not move back in with him until 1645, which was three years after she left. The two remained married until her death in 1652, during the birth of the couple's fourth child. Though their marriage recovered from its early difficulties, Milton writings on divorce got him some unwanted attention. In 1646, English Puritan clergyman Thomas Edwards published a text called Gangrena, which tried to catalog the various Protestant congregations existing at that time and the various heresies that he saw in them. Edwards named Milton and his writings on divorce as heretical. Milton answered Edwards by making fun of him in a sonnet, calling him Shallow Edwards. The sonnet is called On the New Forcers of Conscience Under the Long Parliament. The sonnet also mentions an ambiguous Scotch what you call, which may refer to Robert Bailey, a Scottish commissioner on the Westminster Assembly and author of A Dissuasive from the Errors of the Time, which was published in 1645. The relevant lines in Milton's sonnet read, quote, Men whose life, learning, faith, and pure intent would have been held in high esteem with Paul must now be named and printed heretics by Shallow Edwards and Scotch what you call, end quote. So that's what a 17th century insult in print sounded like. While all of this, his marriage, his being separated from his wife, his writings about divorce, this guy calling him a heretic, this is all an interesting period in Milton's life, but I had read that this was part of his motivation for writing The Liberty of Unlicensed Printing, but that doesn't make sense because he wrote that in 1644, and this Thomas Edwards didn't call him a heretic until 1646, so the timeline doesn't work there. Anyway, it's interesting. Separately, the more common title of Milton's text, Areopagitica, is worth remembering because that's how scholars and historians generally refer to it, but I think calling it the liberty of unlicensed printing is easier to remember and also more readily gives the hearer an idea of what the topic of the text is. After a long period of fighting, over which I have irreverently leapt, on December 6th, 1648, Colonel Thomas Pride, a parliamentary commander, ordered soldiers to purge the long parliament of those members who would oppose a motion to try Charles I for high treason. By the way, this year, 1648, is also the year of the end of the Thirty Years' War, a huge 
conflict that had been happening on the continent of Europe since 1618 and ended in 1648. The following month, on January 30th, 1649, in what has been described as one of the most significant and controversial events in English history, King Charles I was executed. Two weeks later, on February 14th of the same year, the Rump Parliament, that is the parliament that was left over after a bunch of the members were purged, appointed the Council of State. It was in this Council of State that Milton was, in March of that year, appointed Secretary of Foreign Tongues. What he mostly did in that capacity was write the English Republic's correspondence in Latin and other languages. He also was a propagandist and sometimes a censor for the new government, which was later run by Oliver Cromwell. Ironically, he may have sometimes worked to enforce the very act against which he had written, though I don't have any evidence of that. It's just that if he was working in that job during that time period while the act was in place, he must have done that sometime. By 1652, Milton had gone completely blind and thereafter worked by dictating his verse and prose to assistants who would help him. One such assistant, in this case, the assistant is technically called an amanuensis. This is a literary assistant who either writes out dictation or helps to recopy manuscripts and does things like that. Andrew Marvell, himself a poet who was also a member of Parliament from 1659 to 1678. When Oliver Cromwell died in 1658, the Republic collapsed once again into civil war. Millen remained loyal to the parliamentary cause, and though this showed a level of conviction. After the monarchy was restored in 1660, bringing back the government that had been overturned when Charles I was executed in 1649, a warrant was issued for Milton's arrest and his writings were burned. Fearing for his life, he went into hiding. When a general pardon was later issued, he came out of hiding, but he was arrested and imprisoned anyway. It was at this point that his friendship with Andrew Marvell, who was able to get him out of prison, was helpful. Milton composed the entirety of Paradise Lost by dictation, publishing the first edition in 1664 and a slightly revised edition in 1674, into which he added an explanation of, quote, why the poem rhymes not, end quote. So he must have gotten a lot of people asking that. Why doesn't it rhyme? Poems should rhyme. Don't you know how to rhyme? So he wanted to explain that. Some have argued that Milton's despair over the failure of the revolution, because now remember, we have gone from monarchy under Charles I through a war and then a period of a republic. And then now we're back under a monarchy. So this multi-decade conflict and project has ended up back where it started. Some say that Milton's feelings about that loss and coded references to the cause of parliamentarianism can be seen in Paradise Lost, which of course in part describes Satan's mustering of demonic armies in a rebellion against God. It would be interesting to reread Paradise Lost looking for such references and having known more about this historical context. I didn't know about this before. On April 27, 1667, Milton sold the publication rights for Paradise Lost to publisher Samuel Simmons for five pounds, which was the equivalent to about $1,000 in 2015 dollars. He was to receive another $1,000 for each 1,300 to 1,500 books sold, and the first print run sold out in 18 months. So, not bad for 17th century book sales. On November 8th, 1674, in London, John Milton died. I cannot confirm that this is a complete list, but Milton wrote at least 15 poems, one of which is Paradise Lost, for which he is best known and is the length of a modern novel. He also wrote 27 works of prose, one of which we will examine today. Throughout his writing, he reportedly coined 600 new words. Apparently there were 80 new words in the liberty of unlicensed printing alone. There were only a handful of words I didn't recognize when I was reading it, so many of them must have been words that Milton coined at the time but are part of our lexicon today. In fact, I think that the more oft-used abridgment of the title of the work, Areopagitica, is a word coined by Milton. Though I cannot find explicit confirmation of this, I also cannot find the word used anywhere else. The word, coming from the Greek Areopagus, which is the name of a hill where the Council of Athens met, and also where St. Paul delivered a sermon, exemplifies the fusion of Christian and classical Greek thought that reverberates throughout the pamphlet and, for that matter, throughout Paradise Lost. Some of the words attributed to Milton in general that we still use today are pandemonium, lovelorn, earth-shaking, sensuous, debauchery, and one that is not used too often is goosery, which is a nice word for silliness that ought to be in wider use. The Liberty of Unlicensed Printing, 
as I said, was first published in 1644, which was the year after the licensing order of 1643, which instituted pre-publication censorship. That is, before any writing was to be printed, it would have to be approved by the government. Unfortunately, since the political force deployed and the power in play were too great for anyone to pay much attention to Milton, the order remained in place until it was allowed to lapse a half century later in 1695. I realize now that I didn't say that earlier. That's how it's possible that Milton maybe worked on this law, even though he wrote against it, because he wrote against it in 1644, but it stayed on the books. His polemic did not succeed in convincing anybody who had any decision-making power. And then at a later point, he started working for the government, you'll remember. And during that period, this law was on the books, and he sometimes worked as a censor. That's how that overlap happened. Anyway, he tried his best in 1644 to overturn this law by writing this piece, quote, toward the removal of an undeserved thraldom upon learning, end quote. One thing you will notice before you've got your shoes off is how long and sonorous Milton's sentences are. Each sentence is almost its own poem, a vaulted ceiling held up by commas and semicolons arching back and forth over a long corridor. This is not a matter of older language sounding more artful to the modern ear, because we're not accustomed to it. Thomas Hobbes's Leviathan was published in 1651, seven years after this. Leviathan is an important text that is, I think, required reading for people who want to think about the role of the state in civilized life. But after one becomes familiar with the styles in which these two men wrote, confounding them becomes difficult. Despite them writing within seven years of each other, Hobbes is clunky and Milton soars. And it is not only the length of the sentences, it's really the poetry that goes into this prose. It's very clear that Milton spent a lot of time thinking very carefully about words and how to use words and how to fit them together and the rhythm and the structure and all the things that go into doing good writing. To see just how long Milton's sentences are, I ran a test. I put a New York Times article into a website that dispenses a range of statistics about any text you give it, including the average number of words per sentence. Then I did the same for the liberty of unlicensed printing. The average number of words per sentence in the New York Times article was 23. The average number of words per sentence for Milton was 47. That is more than double that of the New York Times on average. These are what Samuel Langhorne Clemens might call transcontinental sentences. Longer sentences are not necessarily better, they are harder to write and can sometimes become confusing if they're not written well. However, longer sentences, when written carefully, can be more efficient by making it easier to avoid repeating certain words or articles in a phrase. If you're not used to reading or hearing early modern English, keep in mind as you listen to this that this is English that is close to 400 years old. While it may not be quite as easy to follow as listening to a friend talk today, if you keep listening, your ear will gradually adjust and you will be amazed with the relative ease with which you can understand it. In many languages, this is not possible. There are, of course, many languages in which no 400-year-old texts exist. In other languages, though such writing exists, it may be too different from the modern version of that language for modern speakers to understand it. For example, we can understand 400-year-old English, and you could fumble your way through Chaucer in the original Middle English, which is about 700 years old, understanding much of it, but needing sidebar definitions for certain words. But without knowledge of that language, you would be helpless before the original Old English of Beowulf which from the first word just looks like a foreign language when put next to modern English. There is, of course, a lot of overlap between Old English and Modern English, but that's not obvious at first. And it won't really help you read Old English any more than there's certain similarities between English and French, and if you speak English, you can pick out certain words in French. In other languages, this linguistic fog appears not about 800 years ago, as it does in English, but as recently as 150 years ago, as it does in Turkish. Remember that this is the oldest English text we have so far studied on this podcast. Of course, the Greek and Roman texts were much older originally, but we examined them in translations that were much newer. Now let's finally eat this cake and see what John Milton, easily among the greatest English poets to have ever lived, had to say about censorship and free speech. This first line we will look at is relatively simple. He says that the best that can be achieved in a commonwealth is not that there be no problems whatsoever, but that the grievances of those living in the commonwealth be heard and addressed. Quote, For this is not the liberty which we can hope, that no grievance ever should arise in the commonwealth, 
That let no man in this world expect. But when complaints are freely heard, deeply considered, and speedily reformed, then is the utmost bound of civil liberty attained that wise men look for. End quote. In another, he points out that the kind of praise that should be sought is praise from a person who would correct you as readily and easily as he would praise you. Quote, he who freely magnifies what hath been nobly done, and fears not to declare as freely what might be done better, gives he the best covenant of his fidelity, and that his loyalist affection and his hope waits on your proceedings. His highest praising is not flattery, and his plainest advice is a kind of praising. End quote. Remember that Milton is addressing Parliament in his pamphlet. Here he says that their willingness to hear reason from any source and to even, if reason dictates, repeal their own law, will show their excellence above others. Here he names specifically the issue, the law he is addressing. He writes, quote, And how far you excel them, be assured, lords and commons. There can no greater testimony appear than when your prudent spirit acknowledges and obeys the voice of reason from what quarter soever it be heard speaking, and renders ye as willing to repeal any act of your own setting forth as any set forth by your predecessors. If ye be thus resolved, as it were injury, to think ye were not, I know not what should withhold me from presenting ye with a fit instance wherein to show both that love of truth which ye eminently profess, and that uprightness of your judgment which is not wont to be partial to yourselves. By judging over again that order which ye have ordained to regulate printing, that no book, pamphlet, or paper shall be henceforth printed unless the same be first approved and licensed by such, or at least one of such, as shall be thereto appointed." End quote. He explains what he's going to say that he will give examples from classical Greece and Rome of people who had censored books and are not the types that his listeners would like to emulate to talk about reading generally and about how the order will not do what it has been set down to do. He then gets into a longer riff about why the law is bad and should be overturned. Quote, but that other clause of licensing books, I shall now attend with such a homily as shall lay before ye first the inventors of it to be those whom ye will be loath to own, Next, what is to be thought in general of reading, whatever sort the books be, and that this order avails nothing to the suppressing of scandalous, seditious, and libelous books, which were mainly intended to be suppressed. Last, that it will be primarily to the discouragement of all learning, and the stop of truth, not only by disexercising and blunting our abilities in what we already know, but by hindering and cropping the discovery that might be yet further made both in religious and civil wisdom. I deny not, but that it is of greatest concernment in the church and commonwealth, to have a vigilant eye how books demean themselves, as well as men, and thereafter to confine, imprison, and do sharpest justice on them as malefactors. For books are not absolutely dead things, but do contain a potency of life in them to be as active as that soul was whose progeny they are. Nay, they do preserve as in a vial the purest efficacy and extraction of that living intellect that bred them. I know they are as lively and as vigorously productive as those fabulous dragon's teeth, and being sewn up and down, may chance to spring up armed men. And yet, on the other hand, unless wariness be used as good almost kill a man as kill a good book, who kills a man kills a reasonable creature, God's image, but he who destroys a good book kills reason itself, kills the image of God as it were in the eye. Many a man lives a burden to the earth, but a good book is the precious lifeblood of a master spirit, embalmed and treasured up on purpose to a life beyond life. Tis true, no age can restore a life, whereof perhaps there is no great loss. And revolutions of ages do not oft recover the loss of a rejected truth, for the want of which whole nations fare the worse. We should be wary, therefore, what persecution we raise against the living labors of public men, how we spill that seasoned life of man, preserved and stored up in books, since we see a kind of homicide may be thus committed, sometimes a martyrdom, and if it extend to the whole impression, a kind of massacre, whereof the execution ends not in the slaying of an elemental life, but strikes at that ethereal and fifth essence, the breath of reason itself, slays an immortality rather than a life." End quote. Skipping ahead, he refers proudly to the English language. Quote, Our English, the language of men ever famous and foremost in the achievements of liberty, will not easily find servile letters anow to spell such a dictatory presumption English. End quote. Then he points out that the censorship comes not from an old government or from a religious one, but from what he calls an anti-Christian council. This is his description of the parliament that he supports. Quote, we have it not that can be heard of from any ancient state or polity or church, nor by any statute left us by our ancestors elder or later 
nor from the modern custom of any reformed city or church abroad, but from the most anti-Christian council and the most tyrannous inquisition that ever inquired. Till then, books were ever as freely admitted into the world as any other birth. The issue of the brain was no more stifled than the issue of the womb. No envious Juno sat cross-legged over the nativity of any man's intellectual offspring. But if it proved a monster, who denies but that it was justly burnt or sunk into the sea? But that a book in worse condition than a peccant soul should be to stand before a jury ere it be born to the world, and undergo yet in darkness the judgment of Radamanth and his colleagues, ere it can pass the ferry backward into light, was never heard before till that mysterious iniquity, provoked and troubled at the first entrance of Reformation, sought out new limbos and new hells wherein they might include our books also within the number of their damned." End quote. And two lines from an earlier portion of that passage are displayed in many public libraries, including the New York Public Library. That's, quote, A good book is the precious lifeblood of a master spirit, embalmed and treasured up on purpose to a life beyond life. End quote. In this next passage, he refers to Pope Dionysius of Alexandria, also called Dionysius the Great, a third century pope and patriarch of Alexandria, most of what is known about whom comes from the many letters he wrote during his lifetime. The passage describes a difficulty and a vision that the man had. Then Milton argues that knowledge by itself cannot be bad, only the intentions of the possessor of the knowledge can be bad. He then draws a similarity between good and bad meats and good and bad books, bringing in a good point at the end about the difference between the two. Another thing that Milton describes Pope Dionysius as doing is reading the books of heretics so that he could understand their arguments and argue better against them. Quote, Dionysius Alexandrinus was about the year 240, a person of great name in the church for piety and learning, who had wont to avail himself much against heretics by being conversant in their books until a certain presbyter led it scrupulously to his conscience how he durst venture himself among those defiling volumes. The worthy man, loath to give offense, fell into a new debate with himself what was to be thought, when suddenly a vision sent from God, it is his own epistle that so averts it, confirmed him in these words, Read any books whatever come to thy hands, for thou art sufficient both to judge aright and to examine each matter. To this revelation he assented the sooner, as he confesses, because it was answerable to that of the apostle of the Thessalonians. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. And he might have added another remarkable saying of the same author. To the pure, all things are pure, not only meats and drinks, but all kinds of knowledge, whether of good or evil. The knowledge cannot defile, nor consequently the books, if the will and conscience be not defiled. For books are as meats and viands are, some of good, some of evil substance. End quote. Skipping ahead, quote, wholesome meats to a vitiated stomach differ little or nothing from unwholesome, and best books to a naughty mind are not unappliable to occasions of evil. Bad meats will scarce breed good nourishment in the healthiest concoction, but herein the differences of bad books, that they to a discreet and judicious reader serve in many respects to discover, to confute, to forewarn, and to illustrate, end quote. Here is a short line about the importance of studying and organizing errors in pursuing truth. This point matters because one of the key arguments for censorship is the prohibition of what is false. Quote, All opinions, yea, errors known, read, and collated, are of main service and assistance toward the speedy attainment of what is truest. End quote. In early modern English, which often sounds so formal to our ear, it is always funny to see the use of ya. Yeah which sounds so informal. This next passage connects the importance of being able to judge for oneself what is right and wrong to Adam eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. He also makes a comparison between the virtue that is often tempted by vice and remains vigilant and the virtue that can only remain virtuous by being isolated from vice, saying that the former is superior to the latter. He says that our impurity can only be purified through trial. Quote, perhaps this is that doom which Adam fell into to of knowing good and evil, that is to say of knowing good by evil, as therefore the state of man now is. What wisdom can there be to choose? What continence to forbear without the knowledge of evil? He that can apprehend and consider vice with all her baits and seeming pleasures, and yet abstain and yet distinguish and yet prefer that which is truly better, he is the true warfaring Christian. I cannot praise a fugitive and uncloistered virtue, unexercised and unbreathed, that never sallies out and sees her adversary, but slinks out of the race where that immortal garland is to be run for. 
not without dust and heat. Assuredly, we bring not innocence into the world, we bring impurity much rather. That which purifies us is trial, and trial is by what is contrary. That virtue, therefore, which is but a youngling in the contemplation of evil, and knows not the utmost that vice promises to her followers, and rejects it, but a blank virtue, not a pure. Her whiteness is but an excremental whiteness." End quote. He then connects all this to the need for the knowledge of good and evil, of virtue and vice, of right and wrong, of true and false, and that this is only possible if people can read books that have not first passed through the filter of a censor. Quote, Since therefore the knowledge and survey of vice is in this world so necessary to the constituting of human virtue, and the scanning of error to the confirmation of truth, how can we more safely, and with less danger, scout into the regions of sin and falsity than by reading all manner of tractates and hearing all manner of reason. And this is the benefit which may be had of books promiscuously read." End quote. He then describes the problem of how you cannot remove material that some may think be harmful without hurting the pursuit of knowledge and learning generally. Further, that people can and invariably do learn to act badly without books, so the effort to censor books for the public good is both futile and itself harmful. Quote, those books and those in great abundance which are likeliest to taint both life and doctrine cannot be suppressed without the fall of learning and of all ability and disputation, and that these books of either sort are most and soonest catching to the learned, from whom to the common people whatever is heretical or dissolute may quickly be conveyed, and that evil manners are as perfectly learnt without books a thousand other ways which cannot be stopped, and evil doctrine not with books can propagate, except a teacher guide, which he might also do without writing, and so beyond prohibiting, I am not able to unfold how this caudalous enterprise of licensing can be exempted from the number of vain and impossible attempts." End quote. Then he touches on the problem of determining who is to do the censoring, who can be trusted with such a task. Quote, Besides another inconvenience, if learned men be the first receivers out of books and dispreaders both of vice and error, how shall the licensers themselves be confided in, unless we can confer upon them, or they assume to themselves above all others in the land the grace of infallibility and uncorruptedness? And again, if it be true that a wise man, like a good refiner, can gather gold out of the drossiest volume, and that a fool will be a fool with the best book, yeah, or without book, there is no reason that we should deprive a wise man of any advantage to his wisdom, while we seek to restrain from a fool that which being restrained will be no hindrance to his folly. For if there should be so much exactness always used to keep that from him which is unfit for his reading, we should in the judgment of Aristotle not only but of Solomon and of our Savior not vouchsafe him good precepts, and by consequence not willingly admit him to good books, as being certain that a wise man will make better use of an idle pamphlet than a fool will do of sacred scripture. Tis next alleged we must not expose ourselves to temptations without necessity, and next to that not employ our time in vain things. To both these objections one answer will serve, out of the grounds already laid, that to all men such books are not temptations, nor vanities, but useful drugs and materials wherewith to temper and compose effective and strong medicines, which man's life cannot want." End quote. He then asks that if books should be regulated, to make people behave well, why eating, rioting, alcohol, clothing, young unmarried men and women, fraternizing, indeed conversation of any kind, should not be regulated also. Quote, what more national corruption for which England hears ill abroad than household gluttony? Who shall be the rectors of our daily rioting? And what shall be done to inhibit the multitudes that frequent those houses where drunkenness is sold and harbored? Our garments also should be referred to the licensing of some more sober workmasters to see them cut into a less wanton garb. Who shall regulate all the mixed conversation of our youth, male and female together, as is the fashion of this country? Who shall still appoint what shall be discoursed, what presumed, and no further. Lastly, who shall forbid and separate all idle resort, all evil company? End quote. Then he argues that people's natures cannot be corrected for by outside policies. Quote, Though ye take from a covetous man all his treasure, he has yet one jewel left. Ye cannot bereave him of his covetousness. Banish all objects of lust. Shut up all youth into the severest discipline that can be exercised in any hermitage. Ye cannot make them chase that came not hither so. Such great care and wisdom is required to the right managing of this point. End quote. He then says, if forcibly correcting people in this way is not possible, there is no reason to do it because while its help is uncertain, 
its harm is certain. Quote, why should we then affect a rigor contrary to the manner of God and of nature, by abridging or scanting those means which books freely permitted are, both to the trial of virtue and the exercise of truth? It would be better done to learn that the law must needs be frivolous, which goes to restrain things, uncertainly and yet equally working to good and to evil. And were I the chooser, a dream of well-doing should be preferred before many times as much the forcible hindrance of evil-doing. For God sure esteems the growth and completing of one virtuous person more than the restraint of ten vicious. And albeit whatever thing we hear or see, sitting, walking, traveling, or conversing, may be fitly called our book, and is of the same effect that writings are. Yet grant the thing to be prohibited were only books. It appears this order hitherto is far insufficient to the end which it intends. End quote. He then names the problems of books that may be, according to some hypothetical censor, partly helpful and partly harmful. What is the censor to do about them? He says the task will require too many people, and eventually certain repeat offending printers will have to be outlawed completely. Quote, there be also books which are partly useful and excellent, partly culpable and pernicious. This work will ask as many more officials to make expurgations and expunctions, that the commonwealth of learning be not damnified. In fine, when the multitude of books increase upon their hands, ye must be fain to catalogue all those printers who are found frequently offending, and forbid the importation of their whole suspected typography. End quote. All of this rides low on the axle with beautiful phrases. Their whole suspected typography. He then points out how Christianity spread without writing. He gives the examples of Italy and Spain, which have been subjected to the censorship of the Inquisition, and asks whether those places seem more moral as a result of that censorship. Quote, if to prevent sects and schisms, who is so unread or so uncatechized in story that hath not heard of many sects refusing books as a hindrance and preserving their doctrine unmixed for many ages only by unwritten traditions? The Christian faith, for that was once a schism, is not unknown to have spread all over Asia ere any gospel or epistle was seen in writing. If the amendment of manners be aimed at, look into Italy and Spain, whether those places be one scruple the better, the honester, the wiser, the chaster, since all the inquisitional rigor that hath been executed upon books, end quote. Then he describes the problem of finding people who are both capable of being effective censors and would also be willing to spend their time on such an unpleasant task. Quote, another reason whereby to make it plain that this order will miss the end it seeks, consider by the quality which ought to be in every licensor. It cannot be denied, but that he who is made judge to sit upon the birth or death of books, whether they may be wafted into this world or not, had need to be a man above the common measure, both studious, learned, and judicious. There may be else no mean mistakes in the censure of what is passable or not, which is also no mean injury. If he be of such worth as behooves him, there cannot be a more tedious and unpleasing journey work, a greater loss of time levied upon his head, than to be made the perpetual reader of unchosen books and pamphlets, oft times huge volumes. There is no book that is acceptable, unless at certain seasons, but to be enjoined the reading of that at all times, and in a hand scarce legible, whereof three pages would not down at any time in the fairest print, is an imposition which I cannot believe how he that values time and his own studies, or is but of a sensible nostril, should be able to endure." End quote. I laughed out loud when I read that the first time. Meaning if he has the smallest amount of sense in him, if only one of his nostrils is sensible, then he could not stand the task. He then says, given this problem, the only people who would be willing to do this work would be ignorant people only doing it for the money. Quote, seeing therefore those who now possess the employment by all evident signs wish themselves well rid of it, and that no man of worth, none that is not a plain unthrift of his own hours, is ever likely to succeed them, except he mean to put himself to the salary of a press corrector, we may easily foresee what kind of licensors we are to expect hereafter, either ignorant, imperious, and remiss, or basely pecuniary." End quote. He then says this bill discourages not the fakers, but the true lovers of knowledge. Quote, if, therefore, ye be loath to dishearten utterly in discontent, not the mercenary crew of false pretenders to learning, but the free and ingenuous sort of such as evidently were born to study and love learning for itself, not for lucre or any other end, but the service of God and of truth, and perhaps that lasting fame and perpetuity of praise which God and good men have consented shall be the reward of those whose published labors advance the good of mankind. Then know that so far to distrust the judgment and the honesty of one who hath but a common repute in learning, and never yet offended, 
as not to count him fit to print his mind without a tutor and examiner, lest he should drop a schism, or something of corruption, is the greatest displeasure and indignity to a free and knowing spirit that can be put upon him. What advantage is it to be a man, over it is to be a boy at school, if we have only escaped the ferula, to come under the fescue of an imprimatur? If serious and elaborate writings, as if they were no more than the theme of a grammar lad under his pedagogue, must not be uttered without the cursory eyes of a temporizing and extemporizing licensor. He who is not trusted with his own actions, his drift not being known to be evil and standing to the hazard of law and penalty, has no great argument to think himself reputed in the commonwealth wherein he was born for other than a fool or a foreigner. When a man writes to the world, he summons up all his reason and deliberation to assist him. He searches, meditates, is industrious, and likely consults and confers with his judicious friends. After all which done, he takes himself to be informed in what he writes, as well as any that writ before him. If, in this the most consummate act of his fidelity and ripeness, no years, no industry, no former proof of his abilities can bring him to that state of maturity as not to be still mistrusted and suspected, unless he carry all his considerate diligence, all his midnight watchings and expensive palladian oil, to the hasty view of an unleisured licenser, perhaps much his younger, perhaps his inferior in judgment, perhaps one who never knew the labor of book writing, and if he be not repulsed or slighted, must appear in print like a puny with his guardian, and his censor's hand on the back of his title to be his bail and surety that he is no idiot or seducer. It cannot be but a dishonor and derogation to the author, to the book, to the privilege and dignity of learning." End quote. Then he articulates another practical problem with the law. Quote, and what if the author shall be one so copious of fancy as to have many things well worth the adding come into his mind after licensing, while the book is yet under the press, which not seldom happens to the best and diligentest of writers, and that perhaps a dozen times in one book? The printer dares not go beyond his licensed copy. So often then must the author trudge to his leave-giver that those his new insertions may be viewed, and many a jaunt will be made ere that licenser, for it must be the same man, can either be found or found at leisure. Meanwhile, either the press must stand still, which is no small damage, or the author lose his accuratest thoughts, and send the book forth worse than he had made it, which to a diligent writer is the greatest melancholy and vexation that can befall. And how can a man teach with authority, which is the life of teaching? How can he be a doctor in his book as he ought to be, or else had better be silent, when as all he teaches, all he delivers, is but under the tuition, under the correction of his patriarchal licensor to blot or alter what precisely accords not with the hide-bound humor, which he calls his judgment. End quote. He then warns that under such a law, if a deceased author who had been known in his lifetime were found by someone living to be worth publishing, the law might prohibit it and then cut off all posterity from the man's knowledge just because of some idiot censor. Here he mentions a Knox, which is a reference to John Knox, a leader in the Scottish Reformation. Quote, Nay, which is more lamentable, if the work of any deceased author, though never so famous in his lifetime and even to this day come to their hands for license to be printed or reprinted, if there be found in his book one sentence of a venturous edge, uttered in the height of zeal, and who knows whether it might not be the dictate of a divine spirit, yet not suiting with every low decrepit humor of their own, though it were Knox himself, the reformer of a kingdom that spake it. They will not pardon him their dash. The sense of that great man shall to all posterity be lost for the fearfulness or the presumptuous rashness of a perfunctory licensor." End quote. He contemplates the damage to be done by the law. Quote, if these things be not resented seriously and timely by them who have the remedy in their power, but that such iron molds as these shall have authority to gnaw out the choicest periods of exquisitest books, and to commit such a treacherous fraud against the orphan remainders of worthiest men after death. The more sorrow will belong to that hapless race of men whose misfortune it is to have understanding. Henceforth let no man care to learn, or care to be more than worldly wise, for certainly in higher matters to be ignorant and slothful, to be a common steadfast dunce, will be the only pleasant life, and only in request. And it is a particular disesteem for every knowing person alive, and most injurious to the written labors and monuments of the dead. So to me it seems an undervaluing and vilifying of the whole nation. I cannot set so light by all the invention, the art, the wit, the grave and solid judgment which is in England, as that it can be comprehended in any twenty capacities how good soever, much less that it should not pass except their superintendence be over it, except it be sifted and strained with their strainers, that it should be uncurrent without their manual stamp. Truth and understanding are not such wares as to be monopolized and traded in by tickets and statutes and standards. We must not think to make a staple commodity of all the knowledge in the land. Tomorrow 
mark and license it like our broadcloth and our wool packs, end quote. He points out the injustice in particular in the pre-publication censorship, that it treats even authors and books who have yet committed no perceived offense as all equally offending. He also says that it is an insult to the people and cannot be considered to be done for their protection. Quote, whence to include the whole nation and those that never thus offended under such a diffident and suspectful prohibition may plainly be understood what a disparagement it is. So much the more when as debtors and delinquents may walk abroad without a keeper, but unoffensive books must not stir forth without a visible jailer in their title. Nor is it to the common people less than a reproach, for if we be so jealous over them, as that we dare not trust them with an English pamphlet, what do we but censure them for a giddy, vicious, and ungrounded people? in such a sick and weak state of faith and discretion as to be able to take nothing down but through the pipe of a licenser. That this is care or love of them we cannot pretend, when as in those popish places where the laity are most hated and despised, the same strictness is used over them." End quote. He explains how foreigners had admired England at that time for its freedom of the press, and gives the example of having visited Galileo, who was imprisoned in his home for his scientific research that undermined the ideological order of that time. Quote, and lest some should persuade ye, lords and commons, that these arguments of learned men's discouragement at this your order are mere flourishes and not real, I could recount what I have seen and heard in other countries where this kind of inquisition tyrannizes, when I have sat among their learned men for that honor I had, and been counted happy to be born in such a place of philosophic freedom as they supposed England was, while themselves did nothing but bemoan the servile condition into which learning amongst them was brought, that this was it which had damped the glory of Italian wits, that nothing had been there written now these many years but flattery and fustian. There it was that I found and visited the famous Galileo, grown old, a prisoner to the Inquisition, for thinking in astronomy otherwise than the Franciscan and Dominican licensers thought." End quote. He then talks about how this is not just a matter of opinion. Quote, that this is not therefore the disburdening of a particular fancy, but the common grievance of all those who had prepared their minds and studies above the vulgar pitch to advance truth in others and from others to entertain it, thus much may satisfy. And in their name, I shall for neither friend nor foe conceal what the general murmur is, that if to come to inquisitioning again and licensing, and that we are so timorous of ourselves and so suspicious of all men as to fear each book and the shaking of every leaf before we know what the contents are, if some who but of late were little better than silenced from preaching shall come now to silence us from reading except what they please, it cannot be guessed what is intended by some but a second tyranny over learning." End quote. He then says that this kind of required licensing will then lead to the prohibition of other things, including assemblies and meetings. It is useful here to note that a conventicle is a secret religious meeting. Quote, to start thus betimes that a mere unlicensed pamphlet will after a while be afraid of every conventicle, and a while after will make a conventicle of every Christian meeting. But I am certain that a state governed by the rules of justice and fortitude, or a church built and founded upon the rock of faith and true knowledge, cannot be so pusillanimous. End quote. He quotes the Viscount St. Albans, which I think is a reference to Francis Bacon who held that title, saying that punishing thinkers and seeking to suppress their writing is a sure way to guarantee the propagation of their ideas. Quote, the punishing of wits enhances their authority, saith the Viscount St. Albans, and a forbidden writing is thought to be a certain spark of truth that flies up in the faces of them who seek to tread it out. End quote. He then says that there is more harm done by this requirement on licensing that remains unsaid than what he has been able to describe even thus far. He compares the requirement to a closing off of all ports that would import riches into the country. Then he compares the practice to the Ottoman prohibition on printing. What he's referencing, and he does it only briefly, is the prohibition on printing by Sultan Bayezid I of the Ottoman Empire in 1485. This prohibition remained in place until 1729 when Ibrahim Mutaferika, a Muslim Muslim of Hungarian origin, was permitted to begin publishing under heavy censorship by the religious authorities. Over the next 16 years until his death in 1745, he published a total of 17 different books in a total of 9,700 copies and many maps. He reportedly sold about 70% of them. After his death, his family continued to publish books for another half century with limited success. It is my opinion that this delay in the start of publishing in the Ottoman Empire 
beginning in 1485 and ending in 1729, constituting a delay of 244 years, caused an incalculable delay in the development of the culture of what is today Turkey and in the broader Middle East, which the Ottoman Empire governed, this period overlapping with the zenith of Ottoman power in about 1683. The significance of this delay is hard to overestimate, not only because it so retarded the spread of knowledge among the literate and the elites of the Ottoman state, but also because it slowed the spread of literacy, and most importantly, the spread of knowledge among the ordinary people. And this is a really striking example of just a very bad government policy, potentially an empire-killing government policy. Because first, if you think of Johannes Gutenberg, 1436 or maybe 1440, invents the movable type press in Europe, of course, the Chinese had would block printing, but it hadn't made its way over to Europe, and Gutenberg invented it independently. Then you have William Caxton, 1475, sets up the first printing press in England. So it's only a delay of 1436 to 1475, about 40 years, 35, 40 years, something like that. And then in 1485, Bayezid I bans the press in the Ottoman Empire. So the fact that he came out with this law meant that somebody had come to the Ottoman Empire and set up a press or somebody there had set one up and then he reacted to it with this law. The point is he did not pass this law a hundred years later because it took a hundred years for the printing press to make it to Istanbul. He passed it basically at the same time. It was when all this stuff was starting up and if he hadn't done that, there might be as much Ottoman literature from the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries as there is English literature, and there simply isn't. So Milne was aware of this prohibition when he was writing in 1644 and used it to argue against an only slightly less draconian law in England. Quote, There is yet behind of what I propose to lay open the incredible loss and detriment that this plot of licensing puts us to. More than if some enemy at sea should stop up all our havens and ports and creeks, it hinders and retards the importation of our richest merchandise, truth. Nay, it was first established and put in practice by anti-Christian malice and mystery on set purpose to extinguish, if it were possible, the light of reformation and to settle falsehood. Little differing from that policy wherewith the Turk upholds his Al-Quran by the prohibition of printing." End quote. He then tells a fragment of Egyptian mythology, which is a powerful image for those who are trying piece by piece to reassemble truth over centuries and millennia. Quote, Truth indeed came once into the world with her divine master, and was a perfect shape most glorious to look on. But when he ascended, and his apostles after him were laid asleep, then straight arose a wicked race of deceivers, who, as that story goes of the Egyptian Typhon with his conspirators, how they dealt with the good Osiris, took the virgin truth, hewed her lovely form into a thousand pieces, and scattered them to the four winds. From that time ever since, the sad friends of truth, such as durst appear, imitating the careful search that Isis made for the mangled body of Osiris, went up and down, gathering up limb by limb, still as they could find them." End quote. Then later, quote, "...they are the troublers, they are the dividers of unity, who neglect and permit not others to unite those dissevered pieces which are yet wanting to the body of truth." End quote. He then praises the English nation. He makes an interesting claim that certain writers have said that the wisdom of Pythagoras in Persia somehow can be traced to England. Julius Agricola, whom he names, is the Roman general who was largely responsible for Rome's conquest of much of Britain. Quote, Lords and commons of England, consider what nation it is whereof ye are, and whereof ye are the governors. A nation not slow and dull, but of quick, ingenious, and piercing spirit, acute to invent, subtle and sinewy to discourse, not beneath the reach of any point the highest that human capacity can soar to. Therefore the studies of learning in her deepest sciences have been so ancient and so eminent among us, that writers of good antiquity and ablest judgment have been persuaded that even the school of Pythagoras and the Persian wisdom took beginning from the old philosophy of this island, and that wise and civil Roman, Julius Agricola, who governed once here for Caesar, preferred the natural wits of Britain before the labored studies of the French. End quote. He then depicts, alongside the military industry of England, the nation's cognitive industry. Quote, Behold now this vast city, the city of refuge, the mansion house of liberty, encompassed and surrounded with his protection. The shop of war hath not there more anvils and hammers waking, to fashion out the plates and instruments of armed justice and defense of beleaguered truth. Then there be pens and heads there, sitting by their studious lamps, musing, searching, revolving new notions and ideas, wherewith to present, as with their homage and their fealty, the approaching reformation. Others, as fast reading, trying all things assenting to the force of reason and convincement. 
end quote. He then uses the metaphor of the variety of rocks that comprise a wall to describe how many different ideas and opinions make up a society. Quote, and when every stone is laid artfully together, it cannot be united into a continuity. It can but be contiguous in this world. Neither can every piece of the building be of one form. Nay, rather, the perfection consists in this, that out of many moderate varieties and brotherly dissimilitudes that are not vastly disproportional, arises the goodly and the graceful symmetry that commends the whole pile and structure. Let us therefore be more considerate builders, more wise in spiritual architecture, when great reformation is expected. End quote. He points out how truth is strong enough to fend for itself in an open and unencumbered encounter with falsehood. It need not be subsidized. Quote, Liberty, which is the nurse of all great wits, and though all the winds of doctrine were let loose to play upon the earth, so truth be in the field, we do injuriously, by licensing and prohibiting, to misdoubt her strength. Let her in falsehood grapple. Whoever knew truth put to the worse in a free and open encounter. Her confuting is the best and surest suppressing. End quote. He then continues along a similar line. Quote, when a man hath been laboring the hardest labor in the deep mines of knowledge, hath furnished out his findings in all their equipage, drawn forth his reasons as it were a battle ranged, scattered and defeated all objections in his way, calls out his adversary into the plain, offers him the advantage of wind and sun if he please, only that he may try the matter by dint of argument. For his opponents then to skulk, to lay ambushments, to keep a narrow bridge of licensing where the challenger should pass, though it be valor enough in soldiership, is but weakness and cowardice in the wars of truth. For who knows not that truth is strong, next to the Almighty. She needs no policies, nor stratagems, nor licensings to make her victorious. Those are the shifts and the defenses that error uses against her power. End quote. He explains the problem that even truth often appears false at first glance because of the mist of what is customary and familiar. Quote, if it come to prohibiting, there is not aught more likely to be prohibited than truth itself, whose first appearance to our eyes, bleared and dimmed with prejudice and custom, is more unsightly and unplausible than many errors, even as the person is of many a great man slight and contemptuous to see to. End quote. Then he talks about the value of those who appear to be leading others astray that much can be gained by examining the arguments even of those who are mistaken, not only to verify that they are, in fact, as incorrect as they appear to be, but also to know exactly why they are incorrect, and then to understand the matter more closely. One good example of this is flat earth, that when the flat earth phenomenon, the trend of people talking about the earth being flat, came around, I, like everybody else, said, oh, that sounds crazy. Why do people think that? And then I watched a documentary, not about the earth being flat, but about the phenomenon of people thinking it's flat. And it interviewed some of the people who think the world is flat and whatever. And in watching that documentary, I learned some things about how we know that the earth is round that I didn't know before. So I'm in a way grateful to the flat earth people because I now know more about how we know the earth is round because I'd never thought about it before. And they're saying the earth is flat required that some people come out and demonstrate how we know that it's round. Never mind all the stuff like all the photographs from space and all the planes flying around, how would it even make sense? But there's more simple, very tactile ways to approach this. You can take a laser and measure the curvature of the earth and different things. Anyway, Milton writes, quote, and if the men be erroneous who appear to be the leading schismatics, what withholds us but our sloth, our self-will, and distrust in the right cause, that we do not give them gentle meetings and gentle dismissions, that we debate not and examine the matter thoroughly with liberal and frequent audience, if not for their sakes, yet for our own? Seeing no man who hath tasted learning, but will confess the many ways of profiting by those who, not contented with stale receipts, are able to manage and set forth new positions to the world. And were they but as the dust and cinders of our feet, so long as in that notion they may yet serve to polish and brighten the armory of truth, even for that respect, they were not utterly to be cast away. End quote. In short, he says at one point, quote, Give me the liberty to know, to utter, and to argue freely according to conscience above all liberties. End quote. Those are the passages that I wanted to show you today. Part of Milton's argument is that you cannot correct people by social policy. I think this is partially true. Man is not a clean slate at birth. A million traits vary randomly, but within bounds set by genetics. Just as some are taller and others shorter, some are smarter and others dumber, and some are more and less naturally able to subjugate their appetites in favor of their reason. 
even if we were a clean slate at birth, still some people are irreparably corrupted toward vice early in life. Within all this variation, there will come out some who will be harmful to themselves and to the people with whom they interact. Social policy will never be able to completely erase this phenomenon, nor should we want it to. This solution, which would be worse than the problem, is the nightmare that Aldous Huxley envisions in Brave New World. However, just as man is not a blank slate, nor is he a closed box. He is neither completely formed by his environment, nor entirely isolated from it. People learn spoken and written language along with a myriad other norms and behaviors because they are in their environment. If these things were not in their environment, they would not learn them. You learn your mother tongue because it is the language to which you are most exposed as a young child. The external influences you have as a young adult can significantly affect your thinking. And even as adults, we continue to be affected by what is available in our environment. Man can be taught and accustomed to certain things, whether helpful or harmful to him. And at the population level, it is worthwhile to try to optimize these teachings and customs. To have such a thing as book publishing at all is acting based on a judgment about how society ought to be and what is good for it. To never think consciously about this, or to think that doing so is somehow immoral, means that these influence will happen unconsciously or will be ceded to those who have absolutely no moral reservations about trying to influence mass psychology. It is not that surprising that people seek to forbid others from publicizing certain thoughts, and sometimes from even having them. It is not even surprising that others join in. Humans will take any excuse to try to control each other's behavior. What is surprising is that others submit to it. It is surprising that anyone recognizes the claim of any other person to a right to determine what they can or cannot say, write, or think. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, I hope that you will send the link to it to the readers in your life and that you will buy some books for yourself, your family, and your friends from volrathpublishing.com. That's V-O-L-L-R-A-T-H publishing.com. As I'm making this recording in early 2023, I've only published one book, and that is an edition of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. But I have big plans for what is coming next. So if you want to help to invigorate, to strengthen, to energize, to celebrate, to honor, to steward the European literary canon by means of the printing of new high-quality editions of these classic works with the specially commissioned cover art that they deserve and carefully prepared footnotes that accelerate the flow of reading all for a good price, go order a copy right now for yourself and for the readers you know. With your support and love for and understanding of the true value of classic literature combined with my knowledge of publishing, we can print a whole library of new editions of classic works, both famous and forgotten. Farewell until next time. Take care and happy reading.